This is an I Read Comic Books mini-sode. This week, I am Mike Rappin with the one and only Nick White. Hey. Thanks for joining me this week, Nick. I'm really excited because this is an episode, I think, or I should say a mini-sode, in the making for a very long time simply because, like... A very angry... I'm not going to go into that analogy. <laughs> Nick, you've been beating a, a book over my head for a very long time. A very um, heavy book, to yes. Read. It's, yeah. it's literally a heavy book. I've, I think they've got a huge collected edition out of it, um, and that is Fire in Stone from Dark Horse. But this for this mini-sode, we were trying to go head-to-head with two massive collected books, and the other book we're actually going to be talking about is Planetary from Warren Ellis and... Uh, whose name I'm blanking right now, John, uh, John Cassidy. Cassidy. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about Fire and Stone for the first half of this minisode. In the second half, we're going to talk about Planetary. So this is going to be a huge minisode. Hopefully, we can cover everything we want to get into. So, Nick, explain to me, I mean, like I said, you've been pushing this book, Fire and Stone, on people for forever because when it was coming out, it was this big, huge deal. And I remember Reading Order was a big deal. Why did you want me to read this book? Well, uh, I would have to say that for me, it was sort of my entry into the Alien franchise, oddly enough. Mm-hmm. And, and as some of our readers and readers, <laughs> as some of our listeners know, I quite mean that literally. I'm not talking about films or anything else or in in terms of this comic specifically. I mean, like, literally, mm-hmm. this was my exact entry point. Um, this book was coming out at a point when my pull was a bit lower uh still not as low as as it is now but it was it was relatively lower and it was one of those moments where you're just like you know what I want one or two more books to read I'm just going to really pick something that looks interesting or even if the cover appeals to me I'm just going to go for that um and the covers for these books were just really really interesting really stark evocative imagery uh and it stood out and I obviously knew, you know, the the xenomorph, and I was familiar with that. That was pretty much all I knew was that those things made a, a short work of murdering people, and that was pretty much it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I picked it up, and I found it really, really interesting. And then I found out that there was this really weird m- kind of convoluted release schedule for it, and that it was going to be bouncing between four different books and I was like well this seems kind of ambitious and interesting and uh let's let's give this a try and that's how I ended up reading a 17 issue event about a franchise I knew borderline nothing about pretty much gotcha yeah I mean and this is this is really interesting because I don't really have any real connection or personal ties to like the alien franchise or alien versus predator or prometheus or aliens like none of those books or movies really have like a strong place in my heart but i know that you were like this when this series finished up and wrapped up you were like it's unbelievable how fantastic this was so i remember i grabbed it on a on a whim like on a there was a big dark horse sale and i was like okay sure whatever i'll get it it was really really cheap um and i sat down one night just out of the blue and i was like nick i'm reading your fucking book and so i sat down and i read all 16 17 issues i think actually between two sittings i read the entire volume um like in digital and man, this this covers this goes through four series, like I said: Prometheus, Aliens, AVP, Alien vs Predator, and Predator, with like a one shot at the end that wraps everything up. Um, the the credits on this book are incredible. You got Paul Tobin, Chris Rob- Robertson, Chris Sabela, uh, Josh Williamson, and Kelly Sudeikis on writing duties, as well as Juan Ferreira, Patrick Reynolds, and Dave Stewart, Ariel Olivetti, Al- Christopher Moneyham. Mooneyham, John Lucas on inks during Predator, and Dan Brown on color with Augustin Alesso on the final one shot. Like, and I listed all those in order. You can go look all that up, and I'll put some of this in the show notes. But man, this is a massive story, and I was very impressed. Like, I know I saw the Prometheus movie, and I was like, oh, okay, those big, cool, like Sentinel Titan guys, those look really cool. Um, and boy, this is a much bigger story than I would have imagined. And I, I really was intrigued to see how well connected it all stayed together despite being four separate series and having different writers and artists there was a lot of consistency that rang true like and whoever edited and put this all together which i, th- I think was kelly sue kelly sue yep mm-hmm. like she did a fantastic job of making sure that all the threads followed through and were carried um from beginning to end 
Um, I, I was really impressed. That's like, that was my initial thoughts. And I couldn't stop reading. Like, the only reason I had to break this up into two sessions is because I started reading this at like one in the morning. Yeah. And it got to like two, almost like two thirty, three o'clock. And I was like, I need to go to bed. And then I woke up the next day and finished Predator in, in the one shot at the end. And oh man, beginning to end, this book is so fantastic. It's such a, such an exciting ride. Um, and yeah, that's that. That's my my one off, Nick. What I mean, like, what are your thoughts on this book before I dive into any more of my hubris over and over yeah. and over? <laughs> um, I think a lot of my own personal kind of debate and discussion about the book has to do with how it was organized or how it's meant to be read. Uh, I think. There, there are some ways that you can debate that the way that it was released in individual issues um, with a rotation between uh, different books, bouncing between the books is, is a good way of doing things, but I think there are some issues with that, no pun intended. Mm-hmm. And I think that really comes to a, an issue that we've talked about a lot, which is just the reality of, of having events or having books or having miniseries or, or, or uh, whatnot that are coming out on a monthly basis. You know, just the realities yeah. of having to put out a book that has to arrive in that format instead of an OGN or something like that. And mm-hmm. um, I still like the way the book came out, but I think if there are some problems with it, it, it really has to do with um, sort of the balancing between Predator and AVP. Uh, I think oh, sure. the, the bouncing between those books is where it becomes a little bit of a uh, a bit of a problem. Whereas, like, um, which which AVP and AVP and Predator were both sort of delayed by like a whole month, if I remember correctly. Whereas okay. at the very beginning, you were just getting a bounce back and forth between. Um, Prometheus and Aliens, which kind of made sense. That made a lot of sense because, uh, I mean, this is minor spoilers. Aliens takes place well, six. No, no. I mean, we can we can go into this. Yeah. I, I actually want to yeah. jump into some of the plot. And yeah, we can say okay. here, like, we're going to spoil some bits yeah. and pieces of this. Maybe, but maybe not really reveal everything, but at least some thing. things. Yeah. So Aliens yeah. takes place sixty years before Prometheus, and then everything else happens roughly concurrently slash following Prometheus, and. Mm-hmm. I think what I really like about when you have when you're bouncing back and forth between Aliens and Prometheus is that you're kind of getting the puzzle filled in. It's like very much a cause and effect in a sort of way. Oh yeah. Like what happens in in Aliens is very much setting the scene for what you're uncovering in Prometheus. And so I thought that bounce back and forth was actually really good and interesting and that's why I somewhat encourage reading it that way if you can. But the problem, of course, is eventually you have a bounce back and forth between AVP and um, Predator when really, and I I think I have this right, when really those events aren't, like, one clearly happens before the other. Like, they're not really concurrent. AVP has to happen before Predator, so it doesn't make sense to bounce those back and forth. Right, exactly. It's 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 time hopping really for no reason other than to fit the realities of a production and shipping schedule. So sure, um, yeah, and that was that was something I appreciated about reading the the collected edition was they didn't do any of the bouncing. So right. I read I read it in order of Prometheus, Aliens, AVP, Predator, and then the one shot. And so seeing reading all of Prometheus and then getting Aliens as like this filler like fill in that like kind of filled in some of the gaps that came from Prometheus was really cool actually. And and then reading Predator or excuse me, reading A V P followed by Predator made sense because that's just how linear time worked. Yeah. But, um, exactly. Seeing seeing the bounce back and forth in large chunks from Prometheus to Aliens was really what kept me reading through the first half of this book and made me not want to stop because by the time you finish Prometheus, you kind of go, wait, 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 what the, what just happened? And then right. Aliens continues and starts to fill it in. And it, it's so it's so well executed. And I don't know how Paul Tobin and Chris Roberson like, work together to make this work, but it, it's very well executed. Yeah, I mean, from what I've read, Kelly Sudeconic has talked about the difficulties and the complexities of putting the whole thing together. Um, mm-hmm. And it was a really big deal because... 
I think I've got this right, Aliens comics went on hiatus from 99 until 2009, and even since 2009 to 2014, when um, when Fire and Stone came out, they really hadn't done that much with the franchise. And gotcha. so this was like a really massive undertaking without having attempted anything remotely close um, in years. So so that's that's a big deal. Um, well, was, I think was, that the go ahead the success of the Prometheus film probably helped a lot to push and say, hey, maybe we could get these comics starting again. Well, I think what's really interesting is that I feel like the comic is better able to contextualize and give some relevance and importance to Prometheus uh, Mm -hmm. in terms of placing it within the larger alien canon uh, in a way that maybe people feel like the film itself didn't really do that, and I'm not saying it had to, but I feel like this comic uh, attempts to weave threads between everything in a way that obviously no no film has ever done that's for sure you know no no film has attempted to to take on all of this at once but um mm-hmm. was there was there a story that really stood out to you was there one that you preferred um over the rest so yeah the thing the thing that got me was i really loved the prometheus story like juan Herrera, yeah. excuse me juan ferreira's art is unparalleled in this book and ariel olivetti is also in this book and i want you to like recognize like i love ariel out of elevetti's art like there wasn't a bad artist in this entire bunch like don't get me wrong here but juan ferreira's art stuck out to me in a way that i was like oh shit i'm getting into something really cool really well put together beautifully drawn like the artistry in this book is unparalleled in some places um and so to get like him to start the book and then the book continues with you know patrick reynolds's pencils is fantastic dave stewart on colors is unparalleled and then Ariel out of Olivetti during AVP is just, all right, let's draw the biggest, bulkiest things. Um, but the story that actually I connected to the most um, was probably the alien story. I think I liked that one the most because by the time you hit AVP and Predator, the shit's already really hit the fan and you're kind of getting into endgame sequences where you're like, all right, now we know, you know, that the robot is super bad. We know that the predator <laughs> got some honor bound thing. We know that somebody's going to have a face sucker stuck to them. Somebody's going to get some black goop on them and it's going to corrupt them. You know, we, we get all of the, the kind of standard pieces that are formulaic in some ways when it comes to alien comics or when it comes to predator comics. Sure. And sure. movies even. Yeah. And I don't, I don't dislike that. Like, let me be completely clear. I thought, that using all of these standard formulas of like, oh no, the hubris of humanity has doomed them once again. You know, right, that is such right. a fantastic trope to play with. And it's so well executed throughout this whole thing. You know, we've got a main character who's treating a robot like shit. And then the robot becomes this powerful being. And for some reason, all the predator monsters respect him and the alien monsters like don't want to kill him either. Like, well, that, what, that, what that cool... just falls into the, the aliens trope of, um, predators or um god what are they called uh like uatu or something i forget the technical I have no idea. name uh the but the predators have a very convoluted and complicated code of ethics and uh um, oh yeah <laughs> the the their their rules about who they kill and who they don't and and who they respect <laughs> and who they don't seem often to be contradictory and uh made up on the spot although jordan uh-huh, will uh-huh. tell you that they're they're real so i'm i i think he has their code of conduct written down somewhere in that weird language of theirs that you sure you see sure so um it's it's bizarro but like i i really enjoyed like i think really the alien story to me was the strongest um and i i honestly i like joshua williamson's writing and i feel like he got kind of the the worst deal in the story in that he kind of had to write the sum up of everything and the predator story in the last or the second issue if i'm not mistaken felt a little forced in order to get us into the final two issues um, but it all, I mean, it all wraps up really well. I think Kelly Sudaconic's final wrap up, like actually puts the whole thing together. And by no means am I trying to insult the book and say like, Oh, the last half isn't good. I just didn't think it was as strong as the first half, but on the right. whole, well, the I mean, very good. The, the first half is, is often like a lot of alien films where you're, you're anticipating what's going to happen. Uh, it's an yeah. alien comic. It's an alien film. 
things are naturally going to turn a certain way, that way being bad, uh, and that mm-hmm. way frequently involving aliens, obviously. Yeah. So constantly, just like every time you turn around, you open a door and there's an alien monster. <laughs> Right, like, exactly, exactly. And, and so I, I think it was really s- smart to start with with Prometheus because that whole idea that you're going to run into an alien is a bit more of a... It's... How do I explain this? Um, like, it's it's just less anticipatory at that point because you're thinking more oh, about too. Prometheus, which is more about the goop and more about the engineers and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so... Yeah, you're right. The first half yeah. is is build up, and the second half is largely uh, action driven slash violence driven slash uh, payoff, and less about uh, mysteries and 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 wondering how things fall apart, so to speak. Uh, so, I mean, I I I agree with you there. I think um, I feel like Olivetti drew some wonderful issues, but also I feel like AVP. <laughs> kind of narrative wise didn't really do uh i mean it was really just uh the synth uh just wreaking you know wreaking havoc basically yeah um which is not to say that it wasn't bad it's just and and i feel like that's part of what this book was was it was putting people in roles where they would be successful so like yeah pairing you're gonna try- you want yeah. to draw an issue that's all just big beefy dudes kicking the shit out of each other? Okay, yeah. let's put Ariel Olivetti on that. Exactly. That and and when it's going to be horror and suspense, put Paul Tobin and Juan Ferreira together. They'd already yeah. already been working together on Colder for two or three years for Dark Horse at that point. So right, um, right. I mean, that was a perfect pairing. That was a really really good pairing, honestly. So yeah, I, honestly, I, I don't know if it was editorial specifically. I don't know if it was Kelly Sue herself. I'm not certain who was in charge of picking people and assigning them, but I think that that is part of the reason this book is so good, honestly. Yeah, and I I think this is actually a pretty decent primer to get you into this, like, extra alien verse, you know? Because I think, you know, like, Nick, you, you wrote this big, long piece about how you got into the Aliens franchise, and I know this book is heavily mentioned in that. Mm-hmm. And one of the points that you made that always stuck out that I just never clicked in my head was... That they can't use, you know, what is it, Ridley, Ripley? I can't, I can never keep the name straight. Um, right. The the early mandate was that um, Dark Horse was not going to be allowed to use Ripley, uh, Ellen Ripley. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think that if you want to go beyond and you want to see ex- experience more alien horror, like this book does a fantastic job of bringing you into that. In that whole idea, like the same way that. Uh, Dead Orbit did, Aliens Dead Orbit did, where it's, you're kind of stuck in this small space with these aliens that are out to kill you, and they constantly show up, and, I mean, the the funniest part about this whole run is that, like, the alien problem gets worse and worse and worse as the book goes on, because more and more alien things in this black mystery power goop starts taking over more and more of the planet, so it's not just, you know, xenomorphs, it is like crazy monkeys that will rip your eyes out and right. all of a sudden yeah. there's giant fish coming out of the ocean that have you know predator and alien like features it's it's pretty bizarre and i i love that things just got worse and worse as the book went on and then there's the whole mystery of why can't they go up on this mountain which i enjoyed uh it, it all comes together pretty well i i'm gonna keep saying that over and over because this is a very well crafted story and i'm really impressed that a licensed book was able to, to make me this excited about a story because as I've said for years on the show, I don't really get into licensed comics very often, and it takes a lot to get me there, and this is one of those examples that actually works. I mean, this is, and it's mostly Nick's fault that I've gotten into more and more of the alien stuff, but it yeah. also helps that there are like creators like Gabriel Hardman coming onto those books, who I will read James at Stoko. this point anything, yeah. and James Stoko, who I will also read pretty much anything they do at this point. So, I mean, and, and the names on this series alone are enough to draw me in, at least to try it, especially knowing that Kelly Sue DeConnick is putting it all together, and she's got a fucking brain on her, you know? Yeah. So this this whole thing kind of just has a recipe for success, and then it also happens to be really good horror. I, I think what also gives it a lot of traction, and I think this is true of more than a couple franchise books, is that when you see a franchise where the comic book 
uh, element of it seems to, at the very least, be active and, and interested in, in sort of some sort of forward movement or trajectory with the franchise, especially when the the film side of it or the video game side of it or the book side of it or what other sides of whatever the franchise is that exist aren't really going anywhere. Like, I feel like that mm-hmm. gives even more importance and even more credit to it. So, like, especially with the Alien franchise where maybe you're getting a movie every five every six years maybe Mm -hmm. and and even then those offerings tend to not really make people happy um i i think it's even more interesting and even more valid uh when you have the comic book side of things uh filled with people that are interested and, and and creative individuals that are really trying to move the franchise somewhere when when the other aspects of it aren't just just maybe aren't that interested so and i'm not saying like yeah. ridley scott is is a worn out old hack or something but i mean if that's the conclusion you want to come to then i mean uh <laughs> <laughs> you said it not me well, i um, mean it's it's interesting because it's not like this is a book i mean the aliens comics for a long time haven't been like this but it's not as if this is a book that came out as a tie-in to a movie or as a thing to say hey this movie just came out you should also read this comic as like a cash grab right Um, instead it's a standalone story that really really has its own legs and tells a very solid interesting story without having to say oh do you remember from the movie when this happened it's like no no no. you just need to know there's a crazy evil black alien there's a crazy evil predator alien there's this you know these big huge engineer guys and humans are constantly fucking up like, right. It's right. it's a very everyone's simple keeping building secrets block. and exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the my favorite part of this the whole series, I think, was yeah. when they're like, "Yeah, we're gonna take this low orbit freighter, freighter, and we're gonna go to this mystery planet." Um, and then there's like this moment of like, "Wait, something just happened." And then we flash forward, and people are like, "Hey, let's go in the back and see if there's any food." And the guy who put the ship together is like, "No way!" And there's a fucking shitload of aliens inside of the machine. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that to me was just like fantastic. Um, and if you read the comic, it's very, it's much better explained than what I just said. But man, that was that was a really fun thing like the whole like the everything just keeps building on top of itself of like oh man we totally screwed up oh wait we screwed up even more even though we were trying to do something good for each other Uh, i love when those two people are trying to thank the engineer for rescuing them and uh they're like oh thanks you saved us from the alien and then the engineer just turns and vaporizes them (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah oh yeah or uh or when they hit the alien with the atv i love that too Mm mm-hmm a lot of really good, like, action-packed scenes that work really well and kind of give you a nice chuckle. Uh, this this book is is very solid. I will say, if you if you're looking for like an aliens comic that can just you can just read standalone because like a lot of the aliens books, a lot of these are just standalone things that just get put together. Um, this this graphic novel or this collection of all of these series is actually really good. And Nick was telling me that I also need to read the Life and Death series, even though it's not as good? Is that what right. you were saying to me? So, so Life and Death is, is... How should I put this? Life and Death is a similar format, but it makes a few key changes that I think are not really in its best interest. Like, the one-minute summary would be, yes, again, it's four mini... It's, it's four mini-series. Each one is four issues, each one is surrounded around either Prometheus, uh, Aliens, AVP, Predator. That sort of setup is left completely unchanged. What's different is I think that this was a reaction to the success of Fire and Stone, and they were trying okay. to find ways to speed up the process of putting out a follow-up. Um, or come up with a way of doing it that didn't involve getting so many hands on deck. One or one or the two or both. And gotcha. so their solution was to have um, Dan Abnett write all of it. Um, and I should be clear, it, it did also follow the setup of a big oversized one shot at the end as well. And that was Dan Abnett too. Mm-hmm. So with this, you have Dan Abnett writing everything. And instead of having a bounce back and forth between different books with multiple books coming out every single month, Abnett was writing one issue per month. And so, yes, this took 17 months to play out instead of, um, I think, Fire and Stone took place over three. Um, 
So it, it was a bit more drawn out. It was all Abnet, which Abnet is a perfectly fine writer, but I think in terms mm-hmm. in terms of trying to maybe set up some tonal differences between the books, it was a little bit more difficult. Um, but it's still pretty good. They still rounded up some decent artists for it. You've got like Morat Hat from All Star Western. You've got Andrea Moody, who did some fantastic work on uh, Brian Wood's Rebels, uh, and I think Brian. Th- Thies drew the other two parts. Don't quote okay. me on that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, if you were reading it in singles, this one I think some people felt was easier, but it just took a long time. It And the books tonally felt all felt a little similar. But I will say, yes, it does follow up on Fire and Stone. And while not immediately, it does eventually start to interact with the characters and places from Fire and Stone. So, Gotcha. Well, I mean, that's next on my list, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, if if I, only for comparison, I would say yeah, uh, people yeah, out yeah. there, if you liked or if you didn't like Fire and Stone, uh, either way, go check out Life and Death because I think there will be things in that that you will either... Um, like the like the changes or or not like some of the changes that have been made so well cool i i i know we could probably talk about this for another half hour but we got to move on we got to talk about planetary and i i really want to get into this if only because i was super stoked that you were like you know what i'll finish planetary and we can do a minisode and i like my mind was blown because yeah. I love pretty yeah, much anything exactly. Warren Ellis will do. And at this point, I'm a sucker and I'm buying every single thing that he's putting out. Um, it, which, speaking of which, just a small little plug. If you haven't tried Webtoons yet, like the Line Webtoon app, he put out a little series with an artist whose name I can't remember. I think it's it Colleen like, Doran. Uh, Colleen Doran, thank you. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was pretty. It's pretty wild to say the least. But uh, it's very. It's typical Warren Ellis. Um, and the more I read of his stuff, the more I realize he's kind of got the same voice in everything that he does. But you know what? That's okay. I still love that's, him. That's uh, artist tone. <laughs> that's uh, you can't you can't fault someone for that. Jeez, you I can't. You this tend to true. write the same. Well, I'm me, so <laughs> I know, yeah. I know, I've always I know. found that kind of weird. Oh, all your stuff seems kind of similar. Well, it's all me, so exactly. So Nick, okay, you. You did a deep dive into Planetary. I think you read it in a much quicker succession than I did. Um, so I may be a little fuzzy on the details. I read the second half of it probably a month or two ago, maybe a little while after that uh, or before that. But uh, you dove into this. What? T- give me your initial thoughts. Right. Okay. So um, just, a, just a really brief primer perspective for people. So Planetary debuted in April of 1999. The book put out 27 issues and concluded in October of 2009. That's not a mistake. That's 10 years later. Um, There were three one-shots put out on top of those 27 issues, one with The Authority, one that was a crossover with the JLA, and a third that was a crossover with Batman. Um, I think it's kind of interesting because when you look at a book like that with that sort of schedule... Uh, with some very big gaps. I think there were literally three years between the final two issues. You sort of go Mm -hmm. like, I don't know if you could do this anymore. And I think that's one of the first things that sort of struck me about this book is that in some ways it seems like a blast from the past in terms of uh, patience or tolerance or whatever you want to call it in terms of a book coming out. Uh, Because these days, you know, people were losing their shit over... What I think there were five month gaps between the last two issues of Hawkeye, and people were just not having it. Uh, I was or, one of those people. <laughs> yeah, or you know, Sandman <laughs> Overture, where I couldn't believe yeah. that it took three years to. It took um, you know, over the course of three different years uh, to put out six issues. So I, I I gotta hand it to DC because there's something really bizarre about like. It, I don't know if you would ever have a book these days that would take like a three year break if you weren't like image and you weren't well um I mean Black I can Magic. give some context here. I, I feel like I can give some context, right? So Planetary starts in nineteen ninety nine. Warren Ellis is at his peak, right? He is he is coming off of some very successful runs, I believe, on the authority. He has Transmetropolitan, I think, in his back pocket. And Wildstorm is basically banking on the fact that he's running that publisher, right? 
Yeah, I think he was not doing that, Stormwatch at the same time yeah, or around or, that time too. Yeah, yeah, and so he's he's basically like the hottest commodity in comics at the time um, when there wasn't really a lot of hot commodities. Wildstorm at this point is starting to get folded into DC because mm-hmm. Wildstorm was an ind- you know independent publisher, and then they eventually were absorbed by DC and became like a secondary imprint next to Vertigo, and then eventually it just became DC. I think by the end, and so. I, I'm guessing that there was some massive contract that was signed that said, we will complete this whole story no matter how long it takes. And I know that part of it was like, Ellis took some time off. I know that Cassidy took some time off and did some other books. Like, he did right. an entire run of Astonishing X-Men with Joss Whedon before he finished the last issue of Planetary. Like, that's the <laughs> whole reason I got interested in this. Not only did I, was I interested in Warren Ellis, but John Cassidy had just done one of the better x-men books i read in a while i was like what else has this guy done and it turns out like two of my favorite creators at the time did this book and of course it took me you know five six years to me to actually get around to read planetary but um still i i was really interested so i think like as far as this time gap is concerned i'm guessing there was just some massive contractual agreement that dc didn't want to break with warren ellis and john cassidy to say finish your book then get out of our hair because you got to remember uh, between 1999 and 2009, Warren Ellis left DC. He did that whole thing with, um, and if I maybe I have the dates wrong here, but he did that whole thing where he was writing Constantine and he was going to do an episode about school shootings, and then right. Columbine happened and they pulled it. So like that whole gap must have been like a hey big f you wait you're not going to finish this other book and they didn't want to break the contract so it's there, i'm sure there's a ton of other factors that go into it and warren if you're listening john cassidy you guys are listening clear up the record for us but that's my <laughs> thought i think there's some there was some serious contractual obligation there that either dc didn't want to break or ellis and cassidy really wanted to tell their story um and so they were able to come to an agreement to finish it up so many years later yeah, sorry to like completely derail, no, but I think I, like that's that's super relevant. Yeah, so so in in terms of like what this book is, um, you sort of have uh, these three characters. Um, you have Elijah Snow, um, the drummer, and I think Jakita Wagner is the third, mm-hmm. and they all work for this organization called Planetary. Um, Elijah isn't initially a member. Um, he's sort of this guy. He wears all white suits. He has white hair. He looks really pale. Uh, and he's sort of just off doing his own thing and doesn't want to be bothered. And the other two come to him and they offer him, uh, and they put an offer to him, which is twofold, that he'll make a million dollars a year for the rest of his life. And they will attempt to at least wipe all records of his existence, um, you know, as as far as they can, you know, from from uh, the books, I suppose. Uh, in turn, he'll have to join Planetary because they want to find out, quote, what's really been going on this century, and they want him to help uncover the rest. Oh yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I find kind of interesting is you have these these three characters, which all have superpowers to some extent. Um, Snow has the ability to like. I guess, make things cold, but also the ability to dissipate heat. Wagner has the usual power set of, you know, super strength, um, you know, invulnerability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the drummer can, like, tap into machines, and he's, he's like, able to, like, interface with them. Uh, I, don't, I don't know quite how to describe it. And I think the first thing that really appealed to me about this book is that it's not while it is about superheroes it's not really a book about oh we got to go fight this guy or this guy is the bad guy or you know this is earth's latest and greatest threat you know what i mean it's mm-hmm. not really about that they're more about um i think they call themselves like global archaeologists or something like that and it's really just about trying to uncover quote unquote the real history earth um and of course if you're anyone who's interested in conspiracy theories if you're anyone who's interested in um sort of any of that tinfoil hat stuff where it's like oh what was the real history behind this or what was the moon landing Mm -hmm. really about or um (laughs) anything like that this book i think is really 
designed for those people. I, I think it really plays into a lot of those ideas about um, World War II or the nuclear bomb tests or anything like the space race or uh, things like that. Like It really plays into a lot of those things, which of course are definitely in Warren Ellis's wheelhouse of fringe theories and, and, and things that are kind of a weird melding of fact and fiction all rolled into one. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So I like that. Uh, I, I think another thing that super appealed to me about this book is that it more or less starts with a conceit of um, that the this guy called Doc Brass, or, uh, who is basically... Um, Doc Savage, which is another funny thing. Uh, Warren Ellis, I don't know how DC felt about this, but Warren Ellis had a great interest in more or less borrowing or creating analogs of popular comic book characters, uh, <laughs> both of ones that DC did and did not own, um, this being one of them that they didn't. Uh, and anyway, Doc Savage is part of this group, not Doc Savage, Doc Brass, Jesus, he's part of this group back in the day where they build this computer which is supposed to bring about the end of World War II and fix the Earth. And, of course, things go wrong. And um, that's basically just the opening conceit, is that this computer that's opening them up to the idea of the multiverse and everything, it you know, it screws up. Yeah, um, yeah there's, like, a lot of really loose threads for about, like, 12 to 15 issues in this series. <laughs> Like, I feel like every single issue was kind of standalone, and that it kept opening up more doors, and then eventually they start to tie things back, slowly but surely. Well, yeah, I mean, I I think what's interesting is that I I do think there is a point where there is a more overt shift in the book, in terms Mm -hmm. of, like, let's let's put together all of the things we've learned, you know, folks. But I think also, if you really pay attention, especially if you do a second read, he is very carefully setting things into place, like specifically in terms of the group called the Four. Like, there's a oh, lot yeah. that has to do with the Four if you're paying attention in the issues that lead up to the more, no pun intended, the more formal introduction um, to them. There's a lot of threads that uh, that do that. But I mean, one of the things that I really appreciated that you also kind of hinted at is, yeah, it does feel like every issue is its own thing. And I mm-hmm. think that's what's so shocking about this book is that tonally, um, both visually and, and narratively, some of these issues, if if I gave them to you and I didn't tell you who worked on them, you would be led to believe this book had rotating teams. You want to Oh, totally. Them? I think John Cassidy as an artist got exponentially better as this book went on, which is which is, is more proof to say like that it seems like different art teams. And I think there were some issues where he did different styles intentionally, but I, I oh, totally yeah. agree with you there. Yeah, no, totally. And I and I think a lot of it also probably had to do with um, editorial and coloring too. Um, like there's one issue that is meant to look like it sort of looks like a 1920s or 30s kind of pulp um picture book about like one of doc brass's old stories and yeah it's got like yeah. those sort of uh the fonts that are used i mean it's prose it's literally prose using mm-hmm. like 1920s-esque fonts or whatever and you've got those sort of uh blocked out images that look re- like they're uh, black and white and a billion shades of gray that you find in like old storybooks or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it's 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 just amazing uh, how different some of these issues look. And I think probably obviously a lot of that had to do with the fact that I think this book was at least on a bi monthly schedule. From what I've read, that was the original intent at least was every other month. Gotcha. So well, Cassidy doesn't isn't necessarily a fast artist. I think. That that's been proven time and time again with whatever books he's been on. Like, even Astonishing X-Men, I was reading that um, fairly regularly. I think I was reading it single issues? I don't remember. And it, there were massive delays in a handful of things. Like, he's not a, a fast artist, but by no means does that mean he's a bad artist. So, like, a bi-monthly schedule would definitely work better for him. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like, there, there are some issues where I look at this and I'm like, yeah, this this isn't getting done in a month. It's just not happening. But, I mean, it, it's crazy. Like, you have one issue that's sort of 
more or less a Godzilla homage. Um, mm-hmm. Another that has to do with um, like this crazy trippy um, thing called like a I think it's like called a shift ship or something like that. Yeah, where oh, they find man, this the shift ship. <laughs> right. So you have this this um, wreckage that's uh, that they uncover. And it's basically this ship that's capable of, of jumping between the countless versions of alternative Earths. Um, and uh, we get to see the inside of it. And it's 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 the craziest thing ever. It looks like it looks like in some ways like a cathedral that was like flying through space with like um, tinted glass windows. And and they got like dolphins, you know, swimming through the middle of it and it, it looks like the garden of eden to some extent and it's it's mm-hmm. crazy well it's um, like the ship itself is like living and it every time they changed angles it was like a kaleidoscope effect they oh, like yeah. i don't know how you design something like that i can't imagine what the description in the script was to say okay have fun like <laughs> yeah <laughs> I yeah you got, I, I, I wonder with something like that was like warren actively orchestrating all of it or was he basically like give me something cool and uh <laughs> and and Cassidy delivered what he did. I don't know. Um So was there like a bit about this book that like you kept reading obviously. I know like you told me that you were about halfway through and then you spent another week or two like leading up to this recording saying like hey, I'm going to just wrap this book up. Um did you feel like the ending of the book or the last half of the book was satisfactory. I mean, in, to compare it to kind of how I felt about Fire and Stone, I felt like the second half was a little bit lacking in comparison to the first half, although the story on the whole was very good. Did you have the same fe- feeling for Planetary? So, I mean, one of the discrepancies here between between the two books, making them kind of apples and oranges, is that at the end of the day, you finished Fire and Stone in its entirety, and I was reading just the first volume of Planetary. Um so you know the first half so in in terms of like did i find that that the like the lead up to the end of that was kind of satisfactory oh um, okay okay what was that i nothing i we're good i i said i i, I misunderstood i thought you read the whole thing i didn't realize you were just reading the first half so that kind of changes things a little bit so i won't go too spoilery in the last half then <laughs> <laughs> so, but 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 the whole the whole framing question or suggesting uh, narrative that builds as you get towards the end is who is the fourth man, and yeah, this gets at the idea that I mentioned earlier that planetary in terms of its like active team members. I mean, they have assistance and whatever around the world, but it's it's actively always a team of three people, and the three people are. Um, ran and and operated and funded by this person who's called the fourth man, who, of course, they speculate, they say, well, it it, it could be a woman, too. You know, it's the 1990s. There's some line like that. (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah. uh, Which is kind of funny, because it's said by the guy who's been, like, trapped in time or whatever, you know, Axel Brass or whatever, who's super old. So it's it's kind of funny to hear the suggestion coming from him. But regardless, Mm -hmm. it becomes a question of who is the fourth man because Elijah Snow uh, starts realizing that he's got holes in his memory and he's not really certain where these come from and he goes and talks to a friend who basically says like all of this leads to you needing to figure out who the fourth man is I think that that's the most important thing Um, Mm -hmm. and of course it became a question that I mulled over a lot and I was like I mean, can, can we can we reveal who it is? I don't know if that's too much. I don't. Yeah, I mean, we're we're talking about a book that's a decade old. I think it's yeah. okay. Full okay. spoilers again. Yeah. <laughs> for planetary. <laughs> so yeah, so like for me, I was like, each issue is so episodic that we really don't even have like peripheral characters, right? Like people show up for one issue and leave again. There aren't that many people who pop in and out um, beyond right. the initial it- issue they're in, and so I was like. It's not going to be anyone we haven't met before because I think that would be, uh, like cheap. I feel like it's going to yeah. be someone we've met. And I was mm-hmm. like, but all these other people are so peripheral that it's got to be one of the three. And if he's the one who actually has memory problems, like he's got to be the fourth man. Like there's sure it's 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 got to be that. So sure. when he was revealed as the fourth man, I was like, well. Warren, I don't know if you really gave us any other viable options. Um, yeah. 
And that's not to say that that doesn't become its own mystery of, like, why doesn't he remember? What did he do when he was the fourth man? Um, And especially one of those fun things where you realize you've had conversations where you've only seen, like, the silhouette of the fourth man, right? It's like the Mm -hmm. Dr. Claw or whatever from Inspector Gadget. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And so you go back reading those knowing fully well that it's snow, and you're like, oh... So. See, I I was under the impression my my thought was that it was too obvious that it was him. Because, oh well, that was that was part of the problem. Yeah, exactly. See, so my thought was, well, what if it was one of the four, right? Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know because you've met the four, and I was like, well, what if they're playing themselves against each other, right? Because yes. that seems to like this big idea of there's a conspiracy on top of a conspiracy, and no one can really trust anyone, but you have to trust the people that are with you only to a certain extent. And right. the more that Snow met people and started to talk to people, it seemed like no one really under like no one wanted to trust anybody. And I was like, okay, that would be the biggest, like, F you, and then we got to just resolve this somehow. And I don't know how the story would play out otherwise with that, but um, I that was my thought. Like, oh, we haven't met any of these four people yet. Well, really, um, we haven't met them in, in, like, an actual full narrative sense. So mm-hmm. what if it was one of them? Um, but as, as the story goes on, you kind of find out why that's not possible, obviously, other than the reveal. But, like, as you read more later on in the book, it, it becomes a little bit more apparent. But... Um, yeah, there's like there's a lot of fun stuff that goes on after that reveal um because then it becomes a question of like we also we need to figure out why we keep seeing all these mystery things as well as what the fuck are the four actually doing. To, just to just to hark back really quickly to something you said before, um this this team isn't a superhero team like you said, and the reason why is because they always show up to events after the fact. Right, they're like an investigative team. Even though they have all these superpowers, you rarely see them in action because they're always showing up to the big bads or the big fights or the big something after it's all happened. Um, and I always thought that was re- I thought that was an interesting way to play that, um, as especially in the first part of the, the story, like the first half. Of yeah, that. no, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's a difference that matters, and I think it provides a different angle and a look at things, mm-hmm. uh, and it also allows them in a lot of ways to kind of. Like, there's a lot of what I would say is variations on a theme in this book. Like, you get characters, you get narratives, you get um, story arcs that are vaguely similar, like 80% similar to something you know, and yet they've tweaked it. Like, there's one issue that has to do with more or less them uncovering a cape that looks like Superman's cape, but the logo is a little different. You have uh, a green yeah. lantern that yeah. looks similar to the lantern, but isn't quite the same. And I guess the gauntlets, uh, Wonder Woman's gauntlets look the same, although you find out later that they operate very differently. Um, mm-hmm. And you end up throughout the course of this issue seeing more or less origin stories for each of these characters that hail from different universes and have very similar, but yet not quite the same origin stories that we're accustomed to. And yeah. then, of course, you find out that the four were actively involved in snuffing out all of these people. Um, yeah. And that that is... kind of brings more of the, like, multiverse thing into the story, I think. Yes. Yeah, there's, exactly. a lot, there's a lot of that really cool stuff that goes in. And I think, like... Grant Morrison also pulled some of this stuff for his later works, like the multiversity. Not to say that it was like a one-to-one pull, but I think Ellis' story in Planetary here was an inspiration to do some of the crazier multiverse shit that he did. Yeah, and I think in a lot of ways I I feel like Ellis still grounded a lot of that multiversity stuff in terms of what we know and what we expect based on like our own history and whatnot, and I think Morrison Mm might have gone a little off the deep end, so to speak. Sure, but, um, sure. And I and I do love the four, which is just another one of these variations on a theme, or or as I said earlier, uh, Ellis playing with characters that DC doesn't even own. And <laughs> right. <he laughs> basically says, hey, what if the Fantastic Four were basically a an aspect of the space race, a hidden aspect of the space race? So while Apollo was sort of the um, public face on 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 space exploration and getting to the moon and everything what if there was another project that was really doing the work of the cold war called artemis which um 
the plan was to have them, I think it was, reach the moon seven years before Apollo. Mm -hmm. But, of course, they go missing, much like, you know, and so you have the whole Fantastic Four thing where you have this crew and they go into space and they go missing and they come back and they've got weird powers. But what if they come back and they're just mega assholes and that's basically the four? (laughs) They they create, like, this shadow organization that controls the world. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, you have this terrible, terrible group of people, and with the like devastating and, and chilling revelation that what if these four came back with these like literally unmitigated, um, unadulterated powers, and what if they've been just hiding things from the world? Like, what if you know the world could be a massively better place in terms of technology, in terms of preventing war in terms of uh you know medical and technical research and what if they've just been Mm -hmm. withholding all of this from us so yeah it's and it's fun to see it all come to a to a head at the end of the series i'll tell you that um (laughs) we're we're running out of tape here nick so i want to say with all of this do you one think you're going to continue reading this despite your completionist need to read this um are you interested in reading the rest of it and um what was your like favorite aspect of this thing sure uh well i mean i obviously i i have volume two on comiXology so it's already there so that that makes things a lot easier but even um that aside you know i have really enjoyed this book um i think the tonal differences between between issues that provide like these weird homages into everything from Godzilla to there's another issue that has to do all about 1980s DC comics like it's basically an homage to Sandman and Swamp Thing and um mm-hmm. Shade the Changing Man oh man it's so weird it's 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 almost like it's an archaeological dig on DC comics itself in some ways mm-hmm. um it's it's fascinating. It's interesting. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm almost certainly going to finish it because I know that Warren Ellis probably has some even bigger payoffs down the road. And I mean, right now I still have the burning question of trying to figure out how or why like he knows Sherlock Holmes, even though Sherlock oh, Holmes yeah. is supposed to be a fictional character. So mm-hmm. I'm still wrapping my head around that one. There are other have instances you, like that too. It's where I'm like, what? Have you gotten to the to the bit about birthdays being relevant? Right, that it's a group of people all born around the turn of the century, and yeah. someone suggests the idea that um, I forget. There's like three people mentioned. One of them is Snow. The other one is Jenny Sparks. I think the third one is Axel Brass. And mm-hmm. they, I think Brass puts forth the, puts forth the idea that they might have been like created as like the earth's protectors at that turn to like guard it from okay. the oncoming issues or something like that. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to comment any further. You should you should just read it, but yeah, okay. Just curious. Um well cool. Then I guess uh well, maybe we'll have to do a follow up on planetary part 2 <laughs> just to see what you you know, what the final revelations um were and what you thought of them just because yeah, no. versus life of death. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, that's that's a great idea, actually. Life, yeah. life and death versus planetary part two. I love it. I love okay. it. Well, cool, Nick. This yeah. is, this is fun, man. I'm I'm glad that I was able to get into your headspace and understand why you like these uh, alien books. Because <laughs> it's really uh, fun. It was really fun read. No, I'm 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 glad you suggested it, and I'm glad you picked a warren ellis book that wasn't um too out there um and, and to be <laughs> yeah. fair there's there's only a few where i'm like this is this is a little too far it's not like morrison where there's like a significant subsection of, of what he's written where i'm like no no i'm not right. i'm not doing that right so um we'll have cool. to do it again well, sometime yeah i'm i'm excited maybe we'll do that for beginning part of next year or maybe we'll put it on patreon but let's let's wrap this thing up you can follow us on twitter you can follow nick at death star plans you can follow me at mike rappin you can follow the show at ircb podcast where we do all of our regular stuff make sure to join our goodreads group let us know what you thought of this minisode i'd love to hear what people thought of planetary of fire and stone if you haven't read it yet go read it and then let us know what you thought you can check out our website at ircbpodcast.com and you can 
find our pronunciation guide for creator names. You can buy merch. You can buy zines. It's all on that website. Uh, after that, we would encourage you to go ahead and email the show at ircb at destroythesibe.org. If you have any questions about this episode or other episodes or just want to shoot us a line and tell us how much you like the show, that would be the place to do it. You can also reach us on our Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash IRCB podcast. We have exclusive audio. We have early access to episodes. We have uh, Patreon exclusive articles that are dropping there. We have other ones that are dropping days before they go public. We have access to... um, all sorts of really interesting and cool stuff that you don't want to miss out on. Infinity Shred does all the music for our show. They are the best band in the universe. I want to say thanks to Xander for being a wizard, for editing the show. He is the best. And I want to say thank you to the listener for coming out and checking out this episode. We want to know what you thought of Planetary and Fire and Stone, so make sure to get in contact with us via email, on Goodreads, or Twitter, whatever. So until next time, thank you so much. We'll check you later. <laughs>